Back on In Focus, I'm Steve Highsmith. Polling suggests that more than 23 million Americans identify themselves as being in recovery from alcohol or drug abuse. Some others are yet to enter recovery. What is recovery like today? How effective is it and how does it work? With me now is Denise Leckerman, an active supporter of the Living Room Foundation for Addiction Recovery, and Ryan Roth and Kelly O'Brien, addiction recovery advocates. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Denise, as I said, millions of people are in recovery. Some more obviously would like to be or need to be. Um, addiction is actually a growing epidemic, whether it's drug, drug addiction or alcoholism. And the unfortunate part is that society doesn't look at it as a disease. And the way that it's looked at, um, people that suffer or battle the disease of addiction, it um, is almost like taboo to bring it out into the public eye. And the unfortunate part is there's so many people that are in, in the recovery community that have worked their way out of the depths of addiction and that are still, I guess, afraid in a sense to expose you know, their history about addiction and what it's like to live in the active recovery community. And if more people, my thoughts are, if more people exposed their disease of addiction or alcoholism and brought it into the light, that it would actually give people, you know, who battle, are still battle, battling the disease, the courage to come forward to actually do something about it. It's society that I think keeps it squashed down. And truth be told, we all know somebody that's involved with either having an existing problem or is in recovery. And I again want to thank you for that reason for being here and talking about this so that people can understand what it really is like to be addicted and also to be in recovery, to be in the solution phase of life, mm -hmm. in the better place of life. Kelly, uh, when did you know that you first, looking back on it, were going to have or had a problem? Um, I knew I had a problem when I was about 13 years old and I had to take something in order to perform a, my day of going to school. Mm. I would bring alcohol or some sort of substance to keep me going. And I what did you think about that while you were doing it? Did you think that you were cool? Did you think this was medicine? Did you think it was a psychological crutch? I mean, at 13, were you able to give a name or description to it? I just thought I was a teenager. Hmm. You know, everybody was, you know, doing something, and I thought That's nothing you. of it. Yeah. And did you realize that you didn't feel good sometimes? Or at that stage, did you think that, oh, when I do this, I feel good? Oh, I, I felt good when I did it. I, and when I didn't do it, I didn't feel good. And when did that start to turn where you said the good moment is not worth the bad moment? Uh, that didn't happen for quite some time. Mm. It didn't happen until I was about 28 years old and I decided I need help and I need to get sober. Ryan, in, in your case, when did you first realize that you were on a path of addiction? I knew there was a path of addiction at about 18 years old. Uh, however, I was unwilling to do anything at that time. You know, I still believed that I needed this to, uh, to perform, as she said, to, to continue about my day, to be a part of my family, and, and that just wasn't the case. When you say that you knew, we hear a lot of times that people are in denial, that they don't think that they have a problem or that they only partially recognize that there's a problem. So when you say that you kind of knew when you were 18, mm -hmm. was it a, a crystal clear recognition that I have a problem but I'm not going to do anything about it? Or was it like, I think I have a problem and then you move on and forget about it? It was fleeting. Okay. It really was. Yeah. When did, did you start to deal with it? I started to deal with it at about 25. Was there a trigger for that? Was there something that, that was a, an important event that happened in your life? Did you just wake up one morning? or How did you start to say, this is where I'm going to start changing this? Initially, the issue with me was, uh, was purely physical. I was sick and very, very ill. Um, however, that was insufficient for me. I really needed to come to a place later on, I would say about 27, 28, where I felt a, uh, a bottom that was emotional and spiritual and, uh, and affected my family as a whole. And, and at that point, the weight of the addiction really settled upon me. Kelly, was it similar to you that you had to emotionally and intellectually get around this? Exactly. I had a, as we call it, a spiritual awakening. I came to a point where I had to either decide I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do this. And the next step for me, which I truly believed in my addiction, was, you know, death. So I decided I needed help and I reached out for help as 
soon as I realized it. And you reached out to Living Group? I reached out and I went to, um, my sister was actually in recovery and I made a phone call to her and I went to a meeting and I went to five meetings that day. And I had met um, Stevie Leckerman who- um, Denise's husband. Denise's husband, <laughs> right, correct. And I met, I met him before and I, so I knew that there were steps that I could take. So I went to the meetings and then the following day I was offered this wonderful chance to go into Livingren on a the scholarship. scholarship. Yep. And it's a scholarship that Denise, you and Steve formed in memory of your daughter. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, my stepdaughter actually, Lee Leckerman, um, she was 21 years old back in 2003 and uh, she had been out partying at a local establishment, much like Kelly's story where, you know, she was a, a young adult thinking that uh, drinking and partying with the consequences would not touch her and a lot of young adults have that attitude and she was out drinking at a local establishment with some, uh, with some family and friends and when she left the establishment she was intoxicated and at the time she had lived out uh, Skip Back Pike, uh, Worcester, PA and she was driving her car intoxicated. She ran her car off the road about, about three quarters of a mile away from the house and caused some damage to the underside of her car and decided to get out of the car and walk the rest of the way home and uh, yet again another impaired decision. And as she's walking along Skip Back Pike, it's really dark out there, mm -hmm. um, a car came along and clipped her into the opposite lane. Mm. And the second car that hit her, the driver was also drinking and driving. And that was the car that, that strike is what caused her fatality. So not only was she drinking and driving, but so was the car that hit her that killed her. And um, it was such a tragic event that happened in our lives and um, my husband and I are both involved in the recovery community and have been for several years, 30 plus years, both of us. And we've been involved in a lot of different aspects, mentor programs with the correctional facilities, as well as my husband's also on the board of directors at Living Grin. And previously I was on the board of director of uh, a women and children's facility located in Ben Salem for a period of time. and. We were talking about different ways that we could be of service in the community, and my husband came up with the idea about the scholarship fund, about turning this tragic thing that happened in our lives, in our family and friends' lives, and the loss of our stepdaughter, to what we could do, some, something positive to turn this around, and how we can help others. Being active, an active role in the community and recovery, we're always looking for ways and means to be of service, because the idea is if we involved in the recovery community can speak out about our own um, addictions or you know or process uh, the solution of recovery then my husband came up with the idea of taking it one step further and raising money and awareness about uh, drug addiction and alcoholism and providing funds to what we call indigents people who have no source of funding um, with addiction especially, I think a little bit more so than alcoholism, and not to weigh one against the other, but with drug addiction, um, especially the opiate addiction, that's such an epidem epidemic mm -hmm. you know, these days that at the end, people are not employment worthy. They've burned all their bridges, primarily with their family or sources, um, and at the end of the road, you know, people aren't thinking about being able to take care of themselves, especially in um, health insurance and those, you know, that capacity. And with the way that the insurance has changed and public funding, that's even diminished a lot because of the way that um, the healthcare industry uh, deciphers mental illness against drug addiction. And recently in legislation, they've been bringing it back together, but the funding is very limited. So. Our, our thoughts, and my husband had the idea of, of creating the scholarship fund. And so you have the scholarship fund, and Kelly was the first recipient she of that. She was. So to be clear, Livingren is a nonprofit facility, but there are obviously costs involved. Insurance can, in some cases, cover, as you're explaining some people, but yes. not in others. There's family support that may or may not be there. And this was a, literally a lifesaver for you. Uh, a lifesaver. It was, uh, I was out in the water, and I got saved. 
Um, well, when we come back, I want to hear more from you as to what programs actually worked, uh, what resonated with you and reached you so that you could be who you are today. When we continue more with Kelly and Ryan and Denise as we talk recovery from addiction in a moment on THL 17. In Focus continues on PHL 17 as we talk about the life of recovery with Denise Leckerman, an active supporter of the Living Grand Foundation for Addiction and Recovery, and Ryan Roth and Kelly O'Brien, addiction recovery advocates and beneficiaries of the Living Grand experience as well. And Living Grand is an organization based in Bucks and Montgomery counties, but operates throughout the region, has residential programming, also has outpatient programming, does detoxification, has nursing programs, has programs for first responders has a lot of different things going on in different communities. But for you, Ryan, what actually worked? What was it like at Livergren? Did you use the residential or outpatient? I did the residential treatment. Uh, I went through detox and then stayed for a number of days thereafter. And, and how does that work? What goes on during that period? Detoxification, in that period, you're, uh, you're medically assisted through the detoxification process and they bring in outside meetings for you to, uh, to understand what goes on in the recovery community introduce you to some people and, and get you uh, acquainted to the community of Living Grin. And after detox, what are they trying to teach you or you learn yourself uh, uh, about how to live a recovered life? Right. Residential treatment is primarily about, uh, about learning the process of recovery, what the, the groups outside of Living Grin look like, uh, acclimating yourself to normal daily routines, waking up at a reasonable hour, many things we didn't do when we were in active addiction. And, uh, and beginning to eat well, sleep well, uh, converse with people, share your story, talk about your struggles if necessary, and talk about your triumphs. And Kelly, was that a similar experience for you? Yeah, correct. I went through detox and then I moved over to the rehab uh, program. I ba they basically taught me how to live because I didn't know how to do that without using a substance. But we have so many triggers in society that can get us back to our old behaviors and if we are chemically uh, predisposed to, ha to, to be addictive, th these triggers may work in hand in hand with that, unfortunately. So if you see beer commercials on TV or people have a Super Bowl party or they have other things, uh, or you know, like some people after a meal, will, well, if they're smokers, they'll say, I can still taste that cigarette I had 20 years ago or something. How do you deal with that? How do they teach you how to deal with those kinds of feelings? Um, go late, leave early. If it's something that you know you're uncomfortable, but you do need to make an appearance, go late, leave early. That's what I've learned. Mm. Um, I don't people, places, and things. I don't go around where I feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I do you I, have foods or anything else though that trigger you? No, no, nothing for you. What about you, Ryan? I have not at this point. No, no triggers know. at all. Uh, you know what? I've been placed in a position of neutrality as a result of the work that I do, and I'm very fortunate to have a group of people in my life that are supportive. I can reach out to them when necessary, and if, if I feel odd about mm -hmm. being in a place, um, usually I'm quick to leave, as she mentioned, but I have a great network. Do you understand your addiction now? Do you understand how it happened, occurred, and grew into the bad place it was in? That's exactly what Livingren taught us. But being there, they explained how it's a disease, and you know, they taught us everything about it, like why we have this disease. It's not like everybody says, you know, there's people with cancer. This is a disease. It's just different. It's a different treatment. That's why we have meetings. That's why we have networks that we were we reach out to. You know, there's NA, AA. Um, I know you both are hardworking people. Now, are you optimistic about the future? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a future now. And, and you, I want to make sure we heard you. You said that. Absolutely. absolutely. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I've been blessed with a great life today, and, and, and the majority of that is a, uh, a deep responsibility in, in sharing this message and giving back to the community and being involved. This is the Living Grin story, Denise? It is. It's a wonderful story. It's, it's amazing to be uh, in the recovery community and watch somebody come in right from coming out of the depths of, of addiction and being able to turn their lives around and become something. Actually, I always say the sky's the limit. The world is your oyster, as people say. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And that's what recovery allows. 
thank you all very much. Thank Congratulations. You. It's great talking with all of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. And that's In Focus for this week. Thank you for watching. I'm Steve Highsmith. Enjoy your weekend. Have a great weekend.